and this is um, the vol so the volcano continues to be in a state of unrest and there is of course an increased risk of lahars as I mentioned before during periods of heavy rainfall so this is something that we continue to look at and um, for the next weeks to months and we will continue to advise of changes in activity based on the monitoring data that we continue to collect so thank you very much for the opportunity to share this information with you today and thank you very much dr joseph for that uh, overview of what has happened during the eruption for certainly sharing with us some of the challenges that the ue seismic research center have had um, particularly with regard to resources and with regard to the covid situation um, for taking us through some of the monitoring signals that you saw as the eruption developed some of the impacts and certainly how you you from a scientific group had to manage and work with the authorities to manage um, the response to the crisis that is still ongoing. Um, of course, I'm sure that people have lots of questions and we'll get to them in the Q&A at the end. But now it's my pleasure to introduce Ms. Michelle Forbes, who is the National Disaster, National Emergency Management Organization's Director. Uh, Ms. Forbes has been with NEMO since December 2004 becoming when she joined as the deputy director and becoming the director in 2017 in may 2017 she is eminently qualified to do the job that she's doing because she holds a bachelor of science honors degree in international disaster engineering and management from coventry university in the united kingdom as well as in 2008 she obtained a fulbright scholarship and went on to complete her master's in public administration um, and also did has a graduate certificate in disaster management from the Andrew Young School of Policy Studies in Georgia State University, Atlanta, Georgia. Certainly in the context of what she has had to deal with in St. Vincent for the past year, uh, COVID and now the volcanic eruption, she unfortunately joins a small group of people who have had to deal with multiple crises in a small island state. So I'm sure she has lots of experience to share and therefore, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ms. Forbes, who will speak to us about the eruption impacts and particularly the response of the civil authorities to the crisis and how they dealt with it and continue to deal with it. So over to you, Ms. Forbes. Good evening, everyone. Pleasant good evening, and thank you for having us um, presenting on the last of eruption 2020-21 and looking at the eruption impact and response of the civil authorities. Just a quick outline, I'll be doing a bit of the pre-eruption planning, looking at the evacuation, how did we respond, and some of the impacts. I know Dr. Joseph would have already mentioned some, and just a quick, some quick conclusion as I go through this evening. We have seen this map, and I in looking at the whole pre-eruption planning, this is one of the guide that we use to really educate and inform persons and look at our civil responsibility in terms of um, planning for such an event. Who would have thought we would have had two eruptions within a 40 to 45 year period? Certainly not many of us. And we thought that we may only have one, one in our lifetime. And this map in particular allowed us to really go into the communities and share this information on persons where they were living um, in relation to the volcano and the hazards that it can expect um, if there's an eruption. We must note in this particular map, years before when I just joined Nemo, Fancy was in the in the orange zone and through advocate, advocating with the Seismic Research Center and of course doing some of the social um, studies and social impact, we thought it best to have from fancy right down to Georgetown based on the pyroclastic flows and be having to move persons in the event of an eruption um, into the red zone. So this map is really um, the one that we use to guide us in a lot of the planning. So much so now, now our persons who have been displaced can tell you whether they're in the red, orange, yellow or green zone. Now, as part of the pre-eruption planning, it, it was not an overnight planning. We have been planning, we have been living with this volcano for quite some time. We thought to update this plan in, in 2014. We tested the plan during the trade, win, trade winds exercise in 2019. And we looked at revising a lot of the work um, around the planning for, for this emer volcanic emergency with the community, with the Seismic Research Center. When we recognized that we would have had some increase in activities November, December, we started to do a bit more work in the community um, in terms of 
ensuring that they, they knew the assembly points, they knew what they had to do in the event of an, an evacuation. We worked with the Seismic Research Center a lot over the years um, in the whole Volcano Awareness Week activities and also in the community sensitization following the fusive eruption in December 2020 and where we had the alert level um, raised to orange. One of the key, ta- key activities during the pre-eruption um, planning um, phase is really looking at resource mobilization. I don't think many persons look at it, um, the amount of resources that you need to really gather to manage an eruption or prepare for one. And one of the things I really want to applaud the Seismic Research Center in January for joining us here in St. Vincent, and we're able to establish quite a comprehensive network, never mind we lost quite a few in the explosive eruption, quite a comprehensive network that really guide us and give us the information to really effect a timely evacuation on April the 8th. And if we did not have that kind of regional collaboration and that resource mobilization, we would not have been able to effect um, that evacuation. Also, um, we must note that once La Souffre went alert level went to orange, it also triggered the regional response mechanism. Hence, CDMA was a key partner in terms of the resource mobilization. And again, we'll express thanks to CDMA and the other agencies and the government of the UK who was able to, um, and the French authorities who also made available helicopters that we were able to use to do some of the installation, some of the surveillance, as we were leading up to the increasing activities at the at the La Souffre um, volcano. We know this alert level well, and um, Dr. Joseph mentioned it too, but just to note, we say we have reduced back to the orange alert um, level on May the 6th, and we continue to monitor, and as we have more equipment being installed um, during the, over the next few weeks, we will monitor and see whether that, that can be reduced further as, as we go along. Now, in part of some of the public education awareness, this was really key in the in the planning and the response and preparing the communities um, for the eruption. And this is one of the products that came out of the Volcano Ready Community Project um, led by the SRC in a collaboration with Nemo and other, other partners here on the ground, where we were able to identify assembly points, um, or muster points, we, we, muster points if you call them that, and we're able to really work through the community mapping and also identifying the vulnerable persons within the communities. And that was one of our big activities, uh, big activity in January, February, asking the community disaster response teams to really look at the vulnerable persons in your community in the, in the event that you have to evacuate. Um, do you have somewhere you're going to stay or do you need um, to stay at a public shelter? And also, would you require public transportation? Because that allowed us to plan to determine how many buses we would need on either side of the island or boats that we would need to evacuate persons. That, that re- all of that happened in the, in the pre-eruption um, planning stage. Now, Early April, we recognized that we started having some increased activity um, activities. We, the week leading up to the actual explosive eruption, we started having the volcan- the VTs or the volcanic tectonic earthquakes. And the communities, especially on the volcano, really started to feel those earthquakes. And you know the alarm was raised and everybody wanted to evacuate. But it wasn't quite the time yet because um, we had the scientists monitoring the volcano and were informing us. But things started to change a little bit, and I clearly recall on the 8th of April, I don't know why I was not sleeping that night, but I continued to monitor the activities at the volcano. And, of course, um, Professor Robertson um, chose to wake me up at 5 o'clock in the morning. Well, I really wasn't sleeping because I expected his call. And shortly after that, this is how things started to cascade and escalate as, as we go through, went through that day. Um, right away, I, I briefed the Prime Minister at 5.45 in the morning. Then we had the Cabinet briefing and press conference. And what what we what I liked about leading up to this particular emergency, not that I really like the exposure eruption, is that um, we're able to always have the scientists with us when we're explaining to the public, when we had our public um our public um, releases and when we had our press conferences, we were able to have the scientists joining us remotely, whether it's the whether Dr. Joseph from Trinidad, Richie here in here in St. Vincent, wherever they were, they were able to join us. So we had a press conference and then we went straight into National Emergency Council meeting really in preparation to really tell the agencies, I think we are getting there now. Um it's all we almost there and we need to put things in place. Lo and behold, at about four o'clock that afternoon, while the Prime Minister was chatting and we were planning for what next, I got the call. The call that I didn't think I would receive, um, hopefully not during my time at NEMO, that it's time. We think that we should consider evacuation order and 
um, we issued the evacuation order shortly thereafter um, to the public. Now let's look at the response a little bit. Um, I don't have a lot of photos. Um, I lost my drive, most of my my drive um, photos from my drive. So in the response and we want to look at the evacuation procedures because I think that is one of the things that we really worked hard on with the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, our local authorities, the police, the cadets, and a lot of other agencies, Coast Guard, um, on the ground, Red Cross, um, leading up to the explosive eruption. We really tightened up our, our sea evacuation planning um, with the Coast Guard and we also tightened up our, our land evacuation planning. In this case, we recognized from since December because of the effusive eruption ongoing, it was, it was mainly towards the western side of the island. We had already made that decision in collaboration with the scientists that once there was an, an evacuation order given, even though communities like Chateaubilly and Fitzhughes that were, they were in the orange zone, we would ask those communities to evacuate um, simultaneously with those what we considered in the red zone, that's from Fancy come down to Georgetown. So we had a bit of a situation in the leeward side where we had a, had a, a road on a construction and the bypass road, if we had attempted to do a land evacuation on the leeward side around Chateaubilly, we would have just had a bottleneck. So we already knew that we had to do a sea evacuation um, on the night of April the 8th, and that was done. It was it was it ran smoothly, and um, thanks to the Coast Guard command and his team, they set up the incident command just off the Chateaubilly Wharf, and we had um, private fort, private ferries that really moved between the Grenadines were able to be called out from the time the evacuation order was given. The sea evacuation was taken was taken charge by the by the command of the Coast Guard, and they moved those um, over a thousand persons were moved from the Chateaubilly jetty um, into Barley um, Barley Wharf. Off. And also, when the when the Barley Wharf was exceeded, we moved persons to, to Kingston and then transported them via via um, buses to other communities that they they were assigned. The windward side of the island, we had land evacuation, and that was that is a bit more um, needs a bit more logistics and planning because from the time you give an evacuation order, it takes about three hours roughly to to for bus before a bus can actually reach to the community. And that time in the afternoon, you know, the buses were nowhere in the community. And as part of our planning leading up to the eruption, we we had different scenarios at different times of the day what would happen. And this is one of the scenarios. Um, <laughs> Coincidentally, we tested this, this particular scenario the week before, around the same time that we were to give the evacuation order, and it happened just the same um, as, as the scenario. And we knew that the buses would not be in the community, and it would take a while, because what we saw from once persons um, started hearing about the heightened activity, we had a rush on the supermarkets, we had tra um, traffic jam, etc. So it was difficult for some of the buses to get to the communities on time. So they would, where you would have had a bit delay on the windward side of the island, but on the leeward side of the island. Island. It went very smoothly. Now, in terms of our response by civil authorities, the National Emergency Management Organization is really charged with coordinating the response to any, any major impact of hazard in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And we have a host of agencies that support us, both nationally and regionally, in terms of our planning and execution if there's an impact. And I'm just giving you a snapshot here from some of the agencies. What happened after the evacuation order was given? The NEOC was, was established right away, and we had different cells moving into the operation center. Transportation was key because we had to call in buses different, um, from different areas to transport persons. We had to activate emergency shelters. Um, we had thousands of persons moving into the emergency shelters um, during that night. Um, we had to have the agency that is going to look at maintenance, put it ready. They had to erect more showers, looking at the toilet facilities, which is Bragsa. And one of the things that we saw we had to do the, the, the overwhelming volume of, of calls and inquiries, it really, not that it crashed our system, it was just too much for our regular system to handle. And we had to est establish a call center nearby um, to in collaborate, well, the, the chief personal officer and the and the um, cabinet secretary really took control of that and ensured that we had a call center operating. We had personnel 24 hours then to really run that call center. And of course, once you have persons in emergency shelter, they have to look at feeding. And persons are also in the private homes who would have left with nothing, even though we would have said, you know, months before, you need to prepare a little bit for for this particular emergency. So the response is a, is, a, is a host of agencies that would have been involved. And it would be remiss of me if I don't thank all those agencies that um, would have 
taken, we're supporting us um, during this time. Our, as I speak, our emergency operations center is, is, is still activated, not 24 hours, but we, we're there about, until about 9, 10 in the evening. And this is going to go on for some time as we continue into the operations. Of course, we have different shifting shifting of, of priorities now as we go further into the uh, into um, managing an early recovery in terms of looking at moving persons from one emergency shelter to the next um, one emergency shelter to the next as we continue. Now the impact, um, we knew that it, the volcano erupted explosively on the morning of 9th April. And while some persons may argue whether the, whether the evacuation order should have been given at one o'clock the day before or whether we give it at four o'clock, the good thing is that we, exe we executed our evacuation plan in, in a timely manner the, the, because of our instrumentation that allowed the scientists to give us that information leading up we were able to um, evacuate persons. We had no deaths and no, no casualty from the volcano itself, and we had a safe evacuation. And we must give credit to the to the, the science plus the evacuation planning and the persons in the community really heed the warning and evacuated so that we didn't have any such such casualties. Now, one of the things coming out of the impact that really kind of crippled us a bit, we had ash fall, I think, from about the Saturday, um, about two days. And of course, once we started having ash fall, our water system shut down. And it meant addi additional pressure, especially when we had, at, at the beginning, close to 5,000 persons in emergency shelters. We had 88 shelters activated by the, by the, by the Saturday. We had 88 shelters activated. And then about 24,000 persons displaced. Because what this eruption also shows us is not just the persons who are in the red and orange zones that were displaced, persons also whose housing may not have been, um, their roof may not have been sealed. They also were displaced somewhat. They could not stay in those homes. Um, they could not stay in those homes because the ash just kept coming in, coming in. And they had to be counted as displaced persons also. Hence the numbers increased. But later on, when we crunch the numbers in terms of who were, who were evacuated from the red or orange zones, we got the true picture from, from, from that, but also it did affect other persons. We know we had over 30 explosive eruptions. The last one would have been 22nd April. But of course, what some of the most devastating impacts we have seen is the pyroclastic flows and the lahars in the communities, especially in Sandy Bay. Um, Sandy Bay has been the most impacted community that has that has a population. And of course, Richmond, Larakai, and Walubu, that should be Walubu, um, would have had a lot of pyroclastic flows and, and feet and feet of ash and deposits within the, on the leeward side. So. We had no access beyond Sandy Bay for almost two weeks. It took us about that time for, we, for us to get to Fancy and really have a good snapshot of what the impact would have been. Um, oh, we and Fancy, we would have done the leeward travel, the, the sea travels, um, but we were not able to go in by land for about two weeks. And, and this is something we have to be guarded um, with going into the hurricane season or hurricane seasons that these communities um, will be isolated for some time um, once we have the heavy rainfall, heavy rainfall of the Lahars, et cetera. Um, of course, we budget, we, we, it's, it, it, it's, it's costing us about $1.2 million um, to, to, feed, to feed persons um, roughly a week. Um, it's quite large, and we would have crunched these numbers with Sidema prior to the eruption, so we knew what it was going to take to really manage 20,000 persons in terms of feeding and support for those persons. Um, we also had to do a supplementary budget, and we know that it has our budget and our economic, uh, economies have been shot during the last year with the COVID. So to, you know, to have a supplementary budget with massive cleanup operations costing over $28 million is quite, uh, is quite um, significant um, as, we, as we go forward. Um, the impact allowed us also to, um, before I get to the conclusion, the impact also, we saw a lot of support from our regional partners. Um, of course, CDMA being one of our partners to be here with us, um, ordering the pre-eruption phase to, 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 to present. And we saw the response, especially from the Barbados authorities, were well, some of the first to come to St. Vincent Barbados, the World Food Programme, and other agencies were some of the first to come on the ground. And that's really was a demonstration of our regional response mechanism, how it works and um, how it really worked and really came through um, following this um, this period of, of, of volcanic arrest into the full, full explosive e eruption. Uh, I, so I want to, as I conclude, I... 
just want to have a few points that we need to ponder on as we go forward. Of course, the evacuation was the evacuation was timely. There are no fatalities. Not to saying that there are things not there are not things that we need to improve on going forward. Of course, there are always um, room for improvement in human systems. The impacts of Villa has will continue for a period. We saw um, on April the 29th in particular, we had some of the first set of Lahas, um, heavy rainfall and Lahas coming through the community of Sandy Bay in particular. We saw that again last weekend where we, with, with heavy rainfall, a, a tropical wave moving through and we can expect this into the rainy season and beyond 2021, we can expect this maybe for another year or two. What is clear though from the impact, um, as we look at the impact, is that we need to look at our, our mapping, our development planning, our physical planning to really guide our development. Do we need to do shall should we rebuild in those areas um, just like that? We recognize any impact it might be about 36 to 50 homes that cannot can no longer stay in the, in the areas that they have been built um, previously. And we definitely look at, have to look at relocation, the temporary housing as we go forward. As I speak, we have just over um, 2,600 persons remaining in the emergency shelters. We are hoping to reduce those number of shelters. We are consolidating, moving persons out of churches, and, and, and out of secondary schools because we have actually had started some education hubs continuing um, in terms of the, the children in the grade six and, and uh, C, the CSEC and the Cape um, students returning. So we have had to move around persons a bit and, and have the children getting back in school. And of course, one of the big things that we don't often hear about that has been the impact as I conclude, the livelihoods impact. Um, agriculture has been devastated. In, in those communities closer to the volcano. Um, persons are in shelters, nothing to do. Um, they, if, even if they go back home, everything is gone. You have to start all over again. And there's no way you can start over right now with ash, you know, inches of ash covering, covering um, your land. So these are the things that going forward we have to look at how do we how do we rebuild how do we how do we continue as communities do we continue to build in those areas um and um and how you know and in terms of building our resilience how do we go forward so the impact has been significant on our people we are resilient people we continue to meet the needs of our people here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and as I conclude I really want to thank all the regional agencies some of you are here who are here today um, the SRC CDMA the CDR our regional governments and, um, and all of our government because we would not have been able to do a massive response of, me, of meeting, meeting the needs of over 20,000 persons with all of the all of government, all of the agencies in St. Vincent, the Red Cross, the CADIS, every single agency and individual who would have played their part in this response. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Forbes, um, for what was a fairly comprehensive overview of what has happened in terms of this uh, of the civilian response. Certainly the importance of pre-planning, the importance of collaboration with the scientific group monitoring the eruption. Um, the, if the fact that the, 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 the response required such a complex mix of groups that make up the NEOC in St. Vincent, um, a very complex response and certainly ending in the, on, the impacts that you have had of the eruption, the significant impacts that have had on Simmons and Grenadine, certainly in terms of agriculture, in terms of ongoing impacts of lahars, um, in terms of the costs of cleanup, the, the impact on people's livelihoods, um, and the ongoing issues that remain. Uh, certainly, the eruption has shown a lot about what one needs to bear in mind in terms of dealing with hazards in the region, and therefore, it is fitting that we can move now to looking at the regional response because certainly as you as Ms. Forbes indicated, the response that was required to the eruption incidents required something that was out, outside the, 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 the capabilities of the St. Vincent Grenadines landmass itself and certainly the regional response has been significant. And therefore it is fitting that we should now introduce Ms. Liz Riley who was appointed the executive director of disaster emergency management organization in May 2020, uh, but who joined Sedima way back in 2001 when she, we, soon after she was appointed as a, direct, as a deputy director in 2012, but had between 2008 and 2012 served um, as, a, you know, acting in position of dire, deputy director. Ms. Riley has over 20 years experience in the area of disaster management um, at the regional and international level in various capacities, 
as a director, she has held overall responsibility for the regional for the for the CDMA's technical programs and provided strategic guidance in the area of preparedness as well as response, mitigation, recovery, education, training, information management. At the operational le level, uh, she has played a role, a leadership role in the coordination of various regional responses to things like Hurricane Ivan, 2004, Haiti earthquake, Tropical Storm Erica, uh, various hurricanes through, from since then. She has had field experience. Um, it includes leadership of CDMA's deployment teams in response to hurricanes Irma in 2017 and Dorian in 2019. And she currently plays a leadership role in the coordination of the regional's, region's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but not only has she been in that kind of position, but she has written, presented, and published technical papers in disaster management and environmental management whilst attached to CEDEMA. And prior to that, during her tenure at the University of West Indies and the Ministry of Physical Planning and Environment in Barbados. Um, Liz, as, as, as I hope I can call her, has lectured in disaster management at the University of West Indies, Mona and Cape Hill. And at the international level, she had contributed to a range of technical advisory committees and is currently the vice chair of the ICG Caribe Early Warning Systems um, in the region for coastal hazards. She holds a, a, a MA in Economics and Environmental and Development Studies from the University of Manchester, United Kingdom, a BSc in Geography from the University of the West Indies, and a Master's Certificate in Results-Based Monitoring and Evaluation and Information Systems from the University of, of Laval in Quebec. So Liz is both experienced and well-qualified to look at and take us through what has been the regional response and solidarity in the context of the La Soufra eruption 2020-21. So, um, Ms. Riley, over to you. Thank you very much, Richie. Good evening to everyone. And uh, I want to say a special thanks to the University of the West in the Seismic Research Center and the Department of Geography and Geology for inviting Sidima to participate. And a special good evening to my fellow panelists as well. So, in the presentation this afternoon, I'll touch on four things to introduce those of you who may not be as familiar with SEDEMA and the Regional Response Mechanism, what we refer to as the RRM. Then I will take you through the regional response to the La Soufriere eruption. I'll touch a little bit in terms of the aspects of the work that SEDEMA will be doing with St. Vincent and the Grenadines on the recovery phases. And then to summarize by looking at some of the key considerations which impacted on this particular response effort. So SEDEMA is an agency of the Caribbean community and we have 19 participating states which are very geographically dispersed as you can see on the right hand side of the diagram. All of those territories in the yellow are SEDEMA states so from as far west as Belize, north to Bahamas, all the way down south to the continental states of Guyana and Suriname. And it means that we have a lot of diversity in terms of the hazards that we face, as well as diversity in the types of capacity across those states. In terms of the mandate of the agency and what we're charged to do, this is outlined in our agreement established in SEDEMA and highlighted on the left-hand side of the screen, you will see the five main areas in which we operate, mobilizing and coordinating disaster relief. You'll see more on that later. We support our states in mitigating or reducing consequences of disasters. We provide comprehensive information on disasters, both in emergencies and outside of emergency times. We work through partnerships, through cooperative arrangements and mechanisms. And of course, we support our participating states to ensure that they have the adequate levels of emergency management capability. And this is done principally through our regional training center. So we also are guided by a regional strategy, and this informs all that we do, and it speaks at the higher level to building resilience in our states and encompasses a number of areas of delivery around strengthening institutions, how we utilize evidence for decision making through knowledge management, strengthening resilience at the sector level by integrating disaster risk considerations there, and of course, community resilience. And there are a number of cross-cutting themes which are captured 
across the base of the diagram. So an important part of the work that we do in the event of an impact to one of our impacted states is the coordination of the response. We have a coordination function similar to explained by Ms. Forbes in the role of NEMO in St. Vincent. So this is a schematic which explains our regional response mechanism and I'll take you through it really quickly. So at the top center of the diagram, you see it speaks to the regional coordination center. And this is the hub, as it were, that is operated by Sedema to get the whole system operating in the way that it should. And on the left-hand side, we talk about the governance arrangements. In other words, those structures and arrangements that hold the entire arrangement together. So you will notice that there are national plans, which were referred to by Ms. Forbes. We have a corresponding regional level plan, and our plans will speak to each other in terms of when we trigger actions at the regional level. We have a space to interface with our development partners, and I'll talk about how we utilize that in the response efforts. And at the bottom of the diagram, you will note that we also have what is called our sub-regional structure. I'll show you that what that looks like on the next slide. But essentially, it's a geographical zoning of our 19 participating states looking at geographical proximity to allow us to have a more efficient response. And I'll explain to you how that worked as well. On the right-hand side of the diagram, this is an outline of the types of teams or surge support, as we call it, that we can provide to our states in the event that they're impacted and they require this type of assistance. So it can be in relief management, emergency operations support, damage assessment, rapid needs assessment, search and rescue, or we can tap into some of our other institutions to get other kinds of technical expertise as well. And you'll see how this mechanism was then applied to the St. Vincent and the Grenadine situation. So the sub-regional focal points, I mentioned this in a previous slide, and I just want to particularly zero in on the central sub-region, which is at the base bottom right of the diagram. And this is the sub-region led by Barbados. And you would notice that St. Vincent and the Grenadines falls within the sub-region. And this will explain why Ms. Forbes had indicated about the rapid response coming out of Barbados, because they act on behalf of the system as the sub-regional focal point because of proximity to give that type of response to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And the other sub-regions in the system are mentioned here, Antigua and Barbuda, Jamaica, Trinidad, and Tobago. So before I get into the specifics of the Sedema actions, just to say a little bit in terms of the context that we were facing as we went into St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So we know it was a complex multi-hazard environment because COVID-19 was ongoing. You have the situation of hazards which are happening across different time scales, an ongoing volcanic eruption, COVID-19 for over 15 months, we knew there were uh, uh, possibilities of severe weather events, and of course, we were close to the hurricane season. And what it meant is that there was a certain measure of uncertainty in terms of what we were going to be dealing with in terms of duration, and specifically with respect to COVID-19, because of the very dynamic situation with COVID-19, it meant that we really had to be very fle flexible in terms of how we were going to handle the response since the arrangements within our system, we draw personnel from states that are not impacted. So it's really a horizontal cooperation arrangement. And because of those waves and troughs that are happening throughout the region, as you're well aware, with COVID-19, it means that we really have to keep our eye on the ball with respect to which countries are going through the waves, which are going through the troughs, and therefore that helps us to understand where can we draw support from to assist the member states. So this is the situation which faced us when the effusive eruption started and of course continued during the explosive eruption. So in terms of Sedema actions, let's talk about those. Coordination. So this is a critical role of the uh, Sedema coordinating unit. And what does it mean? It means how do you bring a group of well-intended participating states, as well as partners, both regional and international partners together and organize them in such a way that it is the most effective 
and efficient type of support that you can provide for an impacted state. And this is a very critical role that is played by the coordinating unit. And we do so within the space of the Caribbean Development Partners Group, which I talked about a little bit earlier. And we had meetings of that group, in fact, from December of 20, uh, 2020, when we alerted them to the effusive eruption. And we started talking about how do we work and work better together to support St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We also established a core coordination group on volcanic hazards. And I'll show you that how that fits on the next slide. And this was important because we wanted to be able to bring together the best scientific minds in the region on vol volcanic ha hazards to discuss the issues and to track what was happening with La Soufrere, but also importantly, to learn from other experiences on how best to approach the response efforts. So as a part of our uh, information clearing function during the entire period of time we issued 31 situation reports they're up on our website if you want to check and this assisted us then in bringing the whole picture together matching the needs identified by country with the response and support that could be provided by partners and this is a schematic here um, just of the regional coordination center in the center in the middle and all of these are cells that would have been activa activated once we had moved into our explosive phase. And you'll see some of this is going to come up during the conversation in terms of resource mobilization, communications, and information we talked about. Logistics, I'll talk about a little bit more. And a lot of the work is carried through by the operation cell. And here's the interface with the partners. And on this side, this is the setup of that conversation at the scientific level on the volcanic hazards. So what are some of the key things that were done? Now, Ms. Forbes mentioned the helicopter support, and this is one of the functions that Sedema provides in terms of resource mobilization. I'll touch on that again a little bit later. But within the core coordination group, we were able to make a presentation at the end of January on a comprehensive budget to our development partners. This was informed by budgets prepared by St. Vincent and the Grenadines, but also by the key regional agencies that were supporting. And as the country identified its needs, part of Sedema's role was to reach out to our development partners and try to identify resources to support that. Um, we had good success, and we really want to thank the United Kingdom uh, through the UK FCDO, that's the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, for coming on board really early and providing immediate resources to allow us to be able to provide the helicopter support to the SRC team. And we think that this was really game changing because as Ms. Forbes explained, this event was heavily driven by the science. We had to know what was happening with that volcano to be able to make the right decisions. And as you see from her presentation, the work of SRC was absolutely invaluable. In addition, uh, the want to go back one okay thank you so with respect to the uh work that the coordinating unit did since december through to april we were integrally involved with the site with the nemo office and the team there working in supporting on evacuation planning logistics planning we had discussions with respect to shelters and a lot of this work was actually done remotely and I really want to thank the coordinating unit team for the tremendous job that they did through that period of January to early April, but also to thank the national level team at Ms. Forbes and her team for being incredibly receptive and really opening minds to how we can deliver support differently. And we had two exercises at the end of January and at the end of March that were mentioned. And these were really important in terms of testing what do we do in particular scenarios? And that work certainly paid off. So other types of support that were provided, we provided emergency operations center assistance. Uh, from the 1st of March, we had personnel on the ground. And I think this was a great decision that was made between Sedema and Nemo to make sure to get the operational support in early so that it was actually on the ground when the explosive phase started. And we've had personnel rotating through now. Here in the photos are two of the early persons on the ground, Captain Herewood and 
um, Superintendent McIntyre out of Grenada, and they did a tremendous job working with the EOC, supporting the updating of operational procedures whilst they were there on the ground and giving specific guidance. We also had other teams on the ground. We fielded a detailed damage sectoral analysis team uh, led by Brigadier General Earl Arthurs from the Regional Security System, and we want to thank RSS for that. And this work was very important in providing St. Vincent and the Grenadines with a preliminary estimate of damage and losses from the event, fully recognizing that there was a potential for and still is a potential for further explosive eruptions. But what it allows is to get a snapshot of what damage and losses were at that point in time, and importantly, to point towards needs and also recommendations. And this has been picked up on and supported as a part of the early recovery process. We want to thank all the partners who supported this particular effort. Logistics was an important piece. And you saw in Ms. Ford's presentation about the level of ash that was um, falling in St. Vincent. And of course, this had implications for access by air. The airport was closed. So logistics in terms of getting the teams in was really important. Um, we worked with our security personnel out of Grenada, St. Lucia, Barbados to facilitate maritime movements. Um, when the air cleared later, the regional security system assisted in direct movements into St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And prior to that, movement to St. Lucia and then transfer to maritime movements. So we want to thank partners for that as well. We also had fielded a, a high level team. Okay, thank you. Um, we also fielded a high level, a team with high, undertaking high level meetings in country. Um, myself accompanied by a senior official from the Caribbean Development Bank. We visited um, St. Vincent uh, quite early after the eruption had to have discussions around how we could better shape that support for the country. We met with uh, finance to talk through some of the financial support available. And of course, working directly with NEMO and the NEMO team on the specific areas that we were engaged in as well. Relief management, absolutely critical. Ms. Forbes touched upon the outpouring of support which came from the Caribbean region, the Sedima participating states and other Caribbean states. But we also had support being provided through a number of our partners, uh, including the UN family provided a, a number of the critical items on the needs list. And of course, we had to then deal with the question of how do we move these items from the areas where they're being donated into the space where it's required, which was in St. Vincent. And this is where a lot of the conversation around the logistics uh, then took place. And specifically, I wanted to highlight the role of tropical shipping, because this is a very important partnership on the, on the logistics side for Sedima. And they assisted us with uh, the movement. Uh, it will be up to three uh, 20, 20 uh, container unit equivalents, 30, sorry, um, 20 container e unit equivalents um, for moving of the re relief into St. Vincent. And so far, a number of countries have taken advantage of this, Antigua, Barbuda, Belize, Dominica, Grenada, Guyana, St. Kitts and Nevis, and Trinidad. And as you can see, a diversity of relief items have been moved into St. Vincent or will be moved into St. Vincent via this mechanism. And we want to recognize tropical shipping and the work that they did in that regard. Here is a breakdown of how we allocated um, per state. And this was very much based on requests from the states in terms of the quantities of the relief items that they wanted moved. And uh, the support was there from tropical shipping. And what was really important is that it was well coordinated by our national disaster coordinators in each of those states. And we remained in close contact coordinating with them to make sure that what was coming to St. Vincent was what St. Vincent asked for. So the question is then, what happens when all of this relief hits the ground? How do we organize ourselves? 
And the answer was really linked very closely to the CARICOM Disaster Relief Unit, which had been dispatched into country with the support of the regional security system. And they assist an impacted state in organizing themselves for reception of relief, breaking down those packages, repackaging and distribution. And in collaboration with the World Food Program, a logistics hub was set up at the Arnest Vale Airport, which is the old airport in St. Vincent. As you know, there's a big open space and I'll show you some additional photos of that in a moment. And so you see what happened at the hub. We had the containers come in directly from the port to the hub and stuffing in this area, it relieved the congestion from the hub. And then inside you could see the breakdown of those packages so that you could then get them out easily to the various shelters. Of course, the CARICOM Disaster Relief Unit also assisted in the Emergency Operations Center, looking at the relief management from that side, um, working at the Geese Port as well. And of course, here's a photo of the Honorable Prime Minister Gonzales with our CDRU Director, Lieutenant Colonel Jason Hills, who was out of Trinidad and the TT Defense Force. Our teams also worked on the logistics concept for um, St. Vincent, working with NEMO to build out a, a concept and a schematic as to the flows that were going to happen. So you see the incoming relief from Ar Argyle Airport, Kingstown, coming into the relief hub, being pushed out to the shelters. And this is the model that was used then to facilitate arrangements around distribution. I want to just touch on the resource mobilization. Ms. Forbes raised it. It's an important point. And we had a very interesting experience with this event because it started, of course, as an effusive eruption. And it, at the end of the day, it was an eruption. And, uh, but what was interesting in the conversations at the level of development partners is what is it within their systems that would actually trigger release of funds? And as it turned out, the majority of the development partners, their triggers were actually more closely associated with the explosive phase of the eruption. But of course, there was a significant level of investment that was required for the preparedness stage. And I think this is one of the issues we'll have to examine uh, as we do the after action review for the La Souffre event and certainly to pick this up in a very direct way with our development partners to see how we can perhaps help to bridge um, this particular matter which came up. But we wanna thank the partners who provided support, whether pre or post the explosive phase. These included the UK, uh, the government of Canada, the European Union, UNICEF was there with us as well, um, USAID, as well as the government of Romania. And we want to thank all of them for their contribution to the 1.2 million US that was mobilized. So coming to the end, I just want to mention recovery because the Sedima Coordinating Unit will be launching this year its Caribbean Resilient Recovery Facility. In fact, this is the first time that we have a fully established recovery function within the agency. And so under the Engender Project, which is co-financed by the governments of UK and Canada and executed by UNDP, We've been able to offer St. Vincent and the Grenadines support in four areas for developing their national recovery framework, specific technical assistance for early recovery, assessment of critical infrastructure, and also resources to finance national interventions that can support recovery actions. And this is under active conversation now through the Ministry of Finance and Planning, which is leading the recovery efforts. So final slide, some of those considerations for during the event and also post event. One is about really reiterating this message about resilience and the reality of the multi-hazard environment where we live. And uh, I think the, this event has underscored that in a way that many events may, maybe we're not able to. And uh, this is a, a critical message, I think, coming forward. We are now, of course, nine days into the hurricane season and uh, predicted to be an active hurricane season uh, with 18 named storms, um, eight of which are anticipated to become uh, hurricanes and four of which are expected to be major storms. That's the prediction by the 
Colorado State University, and we're navigating it in a COVID-19 context. So all of those complexities that are raised with you around where do we source personnel for deployment? When they come into country, how long do they have to quarantine? Do they have to quarantine? Can we have a different arrangement such as what St. Vincent and the Grenadines put in place initially, what, which was called a working quarantine? And all of these are questions that we have to navigate as we go through this season and as we continue in the COVID times. Varying timescales of the events and the uncertainty of duration. We still have an ongoing humanitarian situation in St. Vincent and the duration of that is unknown and that has to be managed. The needs are changing over time and our systems have to be responsive to this. I want to really emphasize the partnership and collaboration, and I want to thank our regional institutions who I think have been absolutely tremendous demonstrating the real essential value that they bring to the regional arrangements and to the regional response mechanism. And I, I want to single out the uh, really excellent work that was done by the Seismic Research Center. You know, we, we were never at, at there were never any gaps in terms of our understanding of what was happening with the event. And this is absolutely essential for an agency like Sedema, which has to deal with coordination because we must base it on the science. Um, flexibility and agility, absolutely critical because in, in, in the COVID times, we do have to make sure we're, we're able to, yes, the plans are there, but we have to be flexible to be able to respond to what we're seeing on any given day at any given time. And that flexibility and agility, I think, is the hallmark of how we're operating at the national and the regional level now. And of course, just to emphasize the importance of the recovery phase, because St. Vincent and the Grenadines will require support from us as a region through the recovery phase. And I just want to indicate here, as we've stated to the Prime Minister, that we are fully committed to supporting St. Vincent and the Grenadines through this process. So with that, I want to thank you again for the opportunity to present and happy to take any questions after. Thank you very much, uh, Liz. Um, and as expected, a very, very comprehensive and thought-provoking presentation, um, certainly taking us through the whole conceptual framework in terms of how the regional response mechanism operates, you know, issues of uh, coordination, search support, logistics, uh, relief management, all those issues that had to be dealt with in the context of, of what evolved in St. Vincent. There's one particular aspect which I trust that we'll get back to, the whole question of resource mobilization and, and what triggers that kind of response. I must tell you that that is an issue that has seen its head arisen in the 1971-72 eruption in 1979. So it's, it's an ongoing thing. When, when do we respond? And is it the explosive phase of the abusive phase? How much you put into the pre-response? And certainly you left us with quite a few considerations, some issues of resilience. How do you deal with resilience in a multi-hazard environment? issues of hurricane and COVID, just like the volcano and COVID, and other issues like that. Lots of things to think about. Um, that said, we will move on now to our next and final presenter. And, and, and fittingly, it would be to someone who would speak to us about lessons and you know what, what, what lessons we can take from this. And, and, and you know, it's, it's quite fitting that we now should move to Dr. Roseanne Smith, who is a Vincentian lecturer at the Department of Geography and Geology at the University of Western East, Mona. She lectures there on several courses, including disaster risk management. Um, she has broad areas of, of research interest, which includes disaster risk reduction, climate change, adaptation, sustainable livelihoods. Um, and in fact, her research area has examined certainly social risk vulnerability as, as it is exacerbated by disaster risk, including climate risk across all social groups. Um, and in fact, she's done quite a bit of research on St. Vincent, on the, particularly on the northern parts of St. Vincent, some of the same communities that have been affected by this eruption. So I must say, Dr. Rose Smith, you are particularly well-placed to take us through as the final presenter and looking at resilience issues and lessons that we can learn from the ongoing eruption that has happened in Sufres. So over to you, Dr. Smith. Thank you so much, Prof. Richardson, Robertson, um, and almost a prof Richie, uh, for your name so much. Um, 
on, on, on social media and just looking at, you know, UB Seismic um, Center videos and so on. I want to thank everyone for organizing the conference or the panel discussion and for having me. I am a proud Vincentian from the Maracqua Valley, the green zone, and I take pleasure in giving this um, presentation because of, of, of where I'm, I'm, I'm going with it. It's, it's about lessons learned. Um, and we have been talking about us being a resilient people. And so we really want to examine what it is resilience is and um, are we going moving towards resilience. This map has um, come up a lot. Um, it has a vulnerability uh, map. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but I want to speak today about you know two things, really. I want to look at the island's vulnerability by just going through a few photos. And then I want to speak a little bit about resilience and the way forward, looking at things from a very um, micro scale, you know, um, examining what I, you know, some of my preliminary research, you know, um, what has been coming out on social media, what has been coming through the voices of the people. And so it's very micro, micro scale in a sense. And so we know the volcanic erupt erupted and the impact was devastating. The impact to infrastructure was devastating. And this is just some a few photos showing the impact to housing. The, the picture on the um, left is Sandy Bay. And you can see it's schools. And you notice a lot of, of it has to do with the ash fall and the roof. Then we also see the impact on agriculture. And this was significant because agriculture itself is the backbone of our economy. And the red zone, a lot of the persons living there are heavily reliant on agriculture. So even as we think about it as the backbone of our economy, we have to think about that it where we have entire households who are reliant on agriculture. So if agriculture is destroyed, the question is what is there? What is next? What is there for them? And so I share two pictures in terms of the livestock that remain in the red zone because we want to talk a little bit about the lessons there and also the agriculture in terms of um, the crops themselves. Um, did any crops survive during the damage assessment? You know, is there something, is there any lesson to be learned there uh, moving forward? I could also speak a little bit about the, the psychosocial impacts, but um, given time and so on, there are so many lessons to be learned here. And it, it is great in a sense that we, we got an opportunity um, to, to, to look at our plans, revisit our plans, because as much as you will put a, a, what you will believe is a solid plan in place, um, it, you, you never really know whether it's, it's a good plan until it's tested. And what the volcanic eruption would have done is given us a chance to, to test our plan and to see you know, where our strengths are and where our weaknesses are and how we can move forward. So I want to start by giving us a, a definition from the United Nations Office of Disaster Risk Reduction of resilience. We have been hearing that term and we use it, I myself use it very loosely because we love to say, you know, as Vincentians, we are a resilient people and we are going to rise from the ash and we are going to bounce back. And yes, we will. But as we get into really looking at how to be resilient, we must examine the definition. And it's at this place we start to think about what are the indicators of a resilient society in light of disaster risk reduction. And so we see the United Nations office is speaking about the capacity of a system, a community, a society, or even households. And they say to adapt, to resist, and to change in order to, to reach an acceptable level of functioning. So our questions, you know, we have to ask ourselves at this moment is, how are we adapting? What does it take for us to resist? and what do we need to change. So I'm going to move forward now by looking at some observations that I would have gathered, as I said, in preliminary research and then looking at the way forward. And one of the things I want to speak about is the communication. At the initial stage, and this is prior to the explosive eruption, there was a lot of conversation um, on social media, even as the information was being shared. Um, persons were speaking about the language being too technical and, and it changed over time. We see um, great attempts to, to, to 
break down that language, but we realized that the, the struggle was uh, was real. Persons were asking, so, so does that mean it's going to erupt? What does that mean? We also talk about the mediums of communication. What mediums um, were we using or what were the plans? And even as we spoke about using all the mediums, when the evacuation order was issued, there was a, a sort of absence of that blast message that we were expecting from Digicel and Flo and so on. And then the, the whole idea of, of, of vulnerable groups like the disabled, we are we factoring these people into the um, communication plans because even as we look at the different um, programs that were, were shared through social media and so on, we did not see someone doing sign language. So we have to really think about that. And then there's the whole um, comment coming out about the, the, the transparency in the communication. And so in thinking about the way forward, we really have to start thinking about establishing a robust multi-hazard communication plan. And for that, we, we definitely have to, 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 to tap into our, our risk communication specialist. We are, it speaks about getting persons on board who are trained. And I like to say, I know we, we tend to ask for consultants and we bring in consultants, but it's really good during this period of research to, to, to find out that we actually have persons in St. Vincent. Um, I know of at least one person with a master in risk communication. So we really have to start thinking about, about developing such a plan. And this plan must consider consider the voice of the disabled. We also have to recognize the importance of social media. And I'm quite certain to recognize it because a lot of the information I have gathered um, was through um, social media, but not simply in terms of just streaming videos and, and, and so on, but in terms of you know, a, a, a greater role in, in, in managing, for example, that um, the Nemo page, you know, constantly there were updates coming in, there were pictures coming in and so on, but there was a case where you really, you know, in terms of questions coming from the public and so on, there were complaints there in terms of getting those addressed. Can we use social media um, to really address questions that the public may have? I also want to speak about the sectoral impacts of um, the volcanic eruption and, and what are the lessons we have learned there. We have seen the impacts of the eruption on livestock and we have seen it on domesticated animals. It was really hard rendering, for, for example, to see that. And, um, you know, we saw animals in need of food, in need of water. And we know that human um, lives would have been the priority. But at the same time, we have to think also a little bit broader. Several persons who remained in the red zone, for example, admitted that they stayed to protect their livelihood. And that is, you know, it, it might seem, so like, I don't know if to say where or why would you stay to protect your livelihood, but there are so much lessons to learn there. You know, what, what they think they can do and, and or their lack of knowledge in terms of, 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 of the eruption itself and the impact it can have. But it also speaks about their connection to land and how significant the livestock is for them. There were questions coming out surrounding whether an um, agriculture plan existed or if there was one whether it was approved prior to the eruption because we we, we saw the livestock were, were still in the red zone and we want to know you know um what was the plan for that so one of the, the way forward is to consider mainstreaming disaster risk management in every ministry and where that has already um, been happening to sort of strengthen it we want the development and approval of hazard specific plans for each sector for the agriculture sector which is very 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 significant um while human lives are important and is a priority we also know about the indirect impacts of of, of volcanic eruption is for example through famine if there's a, if, if there is no food food security is integral it is a must so one of the things that uh, came to mind is is whether we can develop a system for tagging and tracking animals so that they can uh, or they could have been safely removed or in the future we can safely remove them to the green zone and, and this system can allow for, for tracing these animals um, following any disaster and, and, and returning these animals to the farmers. And so it would not really clash with the movement of people because we would have to do that prior um, to, the, to the eruption. So that is something um, going forward that might need consideration. The other important sector, and, and it was mentioned, was the water sector. We saw the 
impacts and the implications of the impact, right? Um, one of the things that occurred was actually one of the truck that was carrying water persons actually try to, to, to steal bottled water um, when the truck stopped. Um, I, 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 I'm not certain if it was to just give some water. And one of the things I would have learned even in distribution of resources is once there is a central hub, you know, um, persons should be advised to not to stop on the way. But uh, and to take it to that distribution point. But even as we think about that, the lessons are there in terms of, you know, what water security and 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 security in the traditional form of the uh, um, sense of the word in terms of policing and 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 military in other countries, other islands, for example, in light of climate change and the crisis in relation to um, water, we see that civil unrest and in a in a in a very small way when we, we we saw the whole issue coming out about the stealing of the water and so on in a way it shows us the implications uh, um if that situation was to go on for a little bit longer so we really have to be thinking about water security one of the coping mechanism that came out was a whole um using of these natural springs and it was amazing the amount of springs that we see um existing on the island and so we know that that is in progress that's a picture of um one of our past students from the department of geography and geology doing some mapping of the local springs and we are hoping to move that not just simply as a coping mechanism but a blueprint for adaptation especially in light of climate change it's you know we, we can think about checking the quality of the water and, and and we can see how much we can um this can be a bottom-up real community driven strategy because as it is there is just like a little what we call a spouting collecting the water but we can see how the community community efforts themselves can come together to to really secure that place um and i think that is um was a very very important point coming out of the volcanic eruption another point coming out was the whole idea of how um, necessary it is to have water tanks for your homes but the whole question of availability and even more affordability um came to the forefront um what what can we put in place to address for example affordability right i know in 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 jamaica here there is a national um housing trust and i know that there are systems in place for example if if you want to to have a water tank you get it at a very low interest rate and 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 so we have to start thinking about how we can put system in place i know for the the public sector that some part of your salary is pulled towards um the, that natural national housing trust but it helps us in in the long run, especially for the poor people, because when you compare the interest rate for mortgage to that of the housing trust, it's very, very low. Uh, and so we have to think about how we can, you know, have a, a greater uptake of households, having this water tank, what, what can we do in terms of working with the, the financial institutions to allow for um, an uptake of water tanks. Um, I know currently, um, this session is going on, but even right now, there's a session going on on my next point, which is ecosystems restoration in light of climate change. So the volcanic hazards would have destroyed vegetation, and we know the important role of those eco um, ecosystem and the ecosystem services provided by different things like the forest and so on. So it, it, we have to start again thinking about an ecosystem um, restoration plan and i like to say drive by the community because i'm one of those advocates for community-based um, disaster risk management even for the health sector and this has been touched on i believe in liz's um, presentation the whole idea that we were operating in a, a really you know, multi-hazard we always use that multi-hazard environment but um saint vincent and the grenadines was a prime example we have the volcanic eruption then there was the, the covid pandemic the de dengue epidemic and even following the the, the um volcanic eruption we saw when we we asked for rain we got rain and we got so much rain we saw the impact of that rain right and and 
observations again show us that even as we look at how persons were dealing with the COVID pandemic, and the, this is some challenges that are currently going on in terms of the wearing of the mask, the following of the protocols, understanding the health and the long-term implications of the ash, you know, walking through the ash and so on. It means that we really have to not simply revisit or create a multi-hazard um, plan for the health sector, but we really have to um, see how we can address education and other things that I will look at in a in a little while. So again, I mentioned the whole idea of community-based organizations and the fact that I am an advocate for community-based organization. And I was happy to see in um, Michelle's presentation, fancy my, my, my daring community. Um, Fancy is one of those communities from way back when I was doing my, my PhD research with an active community-based organization um, group with, with, with um, the help of Nemo and the Red Cross. And, and it's one of those communities that really um, we can use in, as, an, and as a, an um, example to other communities in terms of how a community-based organization should work. Oftentimes, we find that we have a few of these groups and they, are, they see themselves as responders. And we have to move beyond that vision uh, where they are seeing themselves as respondents but, and, and see themselves more in, in, in terms of preparedness and mitigation. One of the challenges that we have seen coming out of the volcanic eruption and any hazard is oftentimes we are limited. We are limited in terms of our financial resources. We are limited in terms of our technical expertise. And there is project funding and, and in, in Several other countries, you know, they're, they're, at times there are calls. So it's time for us to really see how we can strengthen and develop new community-based organization groups. Um, it's also, we need to train these groups, not only in terms of the preparedness, mitigation, response, and so on, but in terms of project writing and grant writing. Because if we are thinking about moving towards resilience, we have to think about having the community not only recognizing that these are vulnerable errors or recognizing that these are the, the um these are our vulnerabilities but also be an active part in terms of addressing it by you know they themselves writing for these grants to build back um stronger again we notice our strong social capital uh, and it has been said in several of the presentations how we work together at the regional level how we work together how we you know the the the, the international community came together and supported us. But one of the things we also see was our local responders. The first responders were our locals. There were a lot of volunteers who were not a part of the official list, who did not, you did not need to ask. They just came at the forefront. In, we, we see the diasporic connection, I myself in the diaspora, and we see how persons work together in the diaspora to sort of strengthen and, and you know, to pull their weight and, and strengthen relief efforts and recovery efforts can we capitalize on that e energy while it exists because we know over time persons tend to forget right is it a case where we can have them work with different community groups encourage them to become a part of community groups and take it from there so those are some conversations we want to have another important conversation is the whole idea of min mitigation i say mitigation or relocation because one of the things coming up a lot in terms of discussion is whether persons should be permanently relocated from the red zones. And there are differing opinions coming out of that. And what I have one here, I pull out on social media because this person actually come from the red zone. And she said, it's been a month since we have been living out of the red zone. And while I cannot speak for everyone, I know my area people can't wait to go back home. After all, home is home. Nowhere, nowhere else is more comfortable. And having worked in the communities, for example, in that northeastern side, I know that there's um, a real closeness between um, the members, right? So the, the home in itself, there's an attachment to place, there's an attachment to land. And so going forward, we have to see how much we can integrate the, the voices um, and involve these people in the discussion on relocation. 
is, is permanent relocation an option? And if not, can we, sh should we be considering internal relocation? Should we be mapping? And I think I, I, I saw that coming out again in the presentation, the whole idea of mapping, but mapping and zoning the communities because we know that there are some persons, some houses that are right along um, um, close to riverbeds, they are along the coast and they are in these high risk zones within the communities themselves so if persons should move back then there would need there would there possibly need to to be some relocation efforts within the community by moving them out but even if they are still there the community are, are still very much high risk so what is it building codes right the ash itself would have destroyed roofs right and that is where the greatest impact was in terms of the ash so we have to think about new building codes possibly or enforcing of building codes but how do we do this in light of the poverty right in light of the poverty that exists in the communities is it enough to say let us enforce building codes right how will they be enforcing the building codes because persons put up little houses just so that they would not be homeless right so what what how can we support that effort in light of poverty the other thing we have to be doing is there is a very very low uptake in terms of insurance whether it's life health or peril insurance generally i'm um, in st vincent and the grenadines and when i did um, my research way back um a few years ago in in those northeastern persons were not taking out peril insurance and all these things for different reasons but part of it again has to do with income you know not having money not trusting in insurance not understanding insurance so what can we do now what systems can we put in place for a greater uptake of insurance because moving forward we have to think about life health and peril insurance because they are all connected in one way or the other in um towards in in terms of in disasters um risk management right on the whole idea of mitigation so i spoke briefly about structural mitigation in terms of rebuilding back and building back better should we remain even whatever zone you, you have to think about um in terms of the ash fall where that it has um, caused tremendous impact how do you build but in terms of education and public awareness a lot of things would have um happened a lot of you know we we have seen from the the USA SMIC presentation what they would have done we we know that nemo would have be keep um would have kept volcanic week yearly and so on but a, is a volcanic week enough because one of the issue we have is the culture of our people and we have a culture of reacting we saw that persons ignore evacuation orders and we saw that persons remained and and i have that little picture there because several times coast guard had to risk their lives <laughs> to go and pull people out of the red zone when they realize that it's worse than they, they would have thought persons did not only stay in the in those zones simply because um they, they, they wanted to protect their livelihood but some actually wanted to experience they have never experienced a volcanic eruption and so we heard those things coming out and we know risk perception is an important part of disaster risk management so going forward we have to think about mainstreaming disaster risk management in schools curricula throughout the caribbean i believe it's time enough we have a wealth of information from varying hazards not just volcanoes but also hurricane and this particular Particular eruption has given us enough videos enough enough um articles and enough pictures information to develop resources not only for primary and secondary but tertiary level we want to, to reach the place where we see CXC questions or CXC exams having disaster risk not simply as one or two multiple choice but an error you know for students uh, whether it's optional or so on so we, we really have to think about that i put mandatory evacuation because you know the, if we are thinking about mandatory there are legislation and policy implications for that but if possibly if we can change our culture of reacting right it's quite possible that we can achieve the same thing moving forward with the information so mainstreaming disaster risk management in schools curricula i know things have been happening i am and we, i know we are moving through um towards that so i'm very extremely happy to see that um you know steps 
taking place for that. And then we want to speak, I want to touch on poverty eradication. As much as I have highlighted all these different things, one of the number one thing, it's number one in the sustainable goals that we have to address is the poverty. So we have heard about extreme poverty in the high, high risk areas. We have seen the heavily dependency on agriculture which is a very sensitive sector. So what we have to do is actually aim towards eradicating poverty we have heard time and time again and oftentimes you 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 know we will um have these where persons have to move we say you have to evacuate and you will say you have to walk with carry three days of food the reality is there are households with no not even one day of food so that is something we have to think about we have to think about implementing national appropriate and this is coming from the sustainable development goals social protection systems and these systems Systems have to be sustainable, right? So it's not one off because the whole idea surrounding social protection systems, it, they, you are supposed there's supposed to be some form of transformative um, change. You 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 you're supposed to be some some sort of change so that you are not moving back to the same position. We are actually moving persons out of poverty to address um, disaster risk, and so everything that you see is linked to poverty. And so we have to think about strategies now to to reduce um the poverty levels in those areas and my final point i want to address is governance um governance is always an issue and i do not want us to think about governance here in terms of oh this is not doing that is not doing because again disaster risk management and the, the whole idea of the volcanic eruption involves a lot of persons so there there would be a case where persons know that this is your role but they go away from actually what they were charged to do so the whole idea of the principles of governance the transparency the accountability you know equitable and inclusiveness um and and responsiveness i note um i, I read an article just this morning which speak about um scientists waiting for permit to install volcanic equipment and I, I listened um to the pm saying you know we cannot have this bureaucracy in a time like this it, it needs to happen and so he was investigating so when i'm when we talk about good governance and the principles of good governance we are i i also want to speak about research we have to assess the extent to which these principles were achieved and which are the areas that we need to strengthen we have to be able to capture the voice of the the, the poor and the vulnerable because one of the things coming out from the UNDP they say ensuring that the voices of the poorest and vulnerable are heard in decisions about the allocation of resources affecting them and so they would have been speaking a lot of so uh, about social media very wary in terms of some of the things that they they, they may not have understood how it work and and wary of the time because they do not understand certain things right we know that St Vincent for example has a, a, a sorting um, political environment and we have seen how the political affiliation would have affected um, certain things. So how has political affiliation impacted the disaster risk management process? That is another question that you know we can investigate and, 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 and think about what we are learning from that, how we can address different Errors, how we can strengthen our allocation and distribution systems. Now, that this is not an easy thing. Regardless of how much systems we put in place, it's always um, it will always need some form of strengthening because there are always lessons to be learned. As I said, once a hazard hit, we get a chance to see things. I, I want to also think about, you know, even as we think about governance and and and, and good governance and 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 how administration administration comes into that the whole idea of creating a database to capture the skill set of our graduates and repositioning some persons who are trained in critical areas so when i've learned for example of persons home because one thing as Vincent, we pride ourselves in as much as we are happy people, a happy bunch of people and so on. We are a highly intelligent bunch of people. And I've seen such solid ideas coming from the voices of Vincent themselves. And then when you investigate their position, I am seeing persons, for example, we have a risk 
a, risk, a person with master in risk communication. We have seen the issue with risk communication, but they are in teaching. So we really have to create a database where we capture our skill sets, you know, of our graduates when they, they when they go and study, and we can see how we can reposition them throughout the ministries, especially if we are mainstreaming disaster risk management in varying uh, various ministries. We really want to 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 reposition persons there who can do the job um, and who who might need extra training, um, ongoing training, and so on. So there are a number of lessons I have not touched all of the lessons that we 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 have learned there are so many lessons as you see we see persons already going into volcanic ash soap using the ash and, and that is another lesson what can we use the ash for but at the end of the day i am going to use the word resilience very loosely and in in its very true sense vincentians are a really resilient set of people we have a lot of lessons and it will take it's an ongoing process it will take some time for us to get back to not only normalcy, but in, in terms of really transforming ourselves. But I believe that the climate is it, 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 it's ripe enough um, you know, to, to really capitalize on, on the skill set and the strengths that we have seen coming out at this um, very moment. So I want to thank um, the, 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 the organizers for having me, um, for being a part of this panel. And um, the research continues because I believe that we, we institutional analysis is important as well as a community level household um, level analysis because there are so much things to learn and even as we think about moving forward um, thank you so much and thank you very much dr smith um, we are a bit over and uh, we have quite a few questions so i'll just quickly um, um, summarize to a certain extent that um, certainly a lot of what you've spoken about is certainly things to take forward and we can certainly explore. Um, I know from my own experience that some of them there's work going on and ongoing in some of those areas, certainly in terms of community-based organizations, in terms of um, looking at sectoral impacts and water supply and various things like that. Um, but unfortunately, I want us to be able to at least deal with perhaps three of the questions, of the many questions we have um, and I'd encourage people to still put their questions and certainly from a, a UE seismic perspective, we'll try to see if we could get some of them addressed, even if we don't do them on, on this uh, occasion in terms of the live, um, the live program. Uh, so my first question I'd, I'd address to Dr. Joseph. I'll have one for Dr. Joseph and then I'll have one for Ms. Forbes and then I'll have one for sort of uh, Ms. Riley and, and, um, and, and sort of more generally everyone to a certain extent. So in terms of Dr. Joseph, there's a question in terms of the chances, and, and I'll try to integrate, there's about three or four questions, but I'll try to sort of, a lot of them relate to, to the same kind of thing. Um, the questionnaire is asking, what's the chance of the, of the volcano going explosive as it did in, in, in April? And, and the question of whether or not you, you saw any precursory signs of it going explosive, and certainly if, if you're likely to see it, see, see it in the future, given what we have. Um, and if you could address that, and in terms of what kinds of things we'd expect if that happens, that that's, that'll be my the, the first question coming coming from one of the um, the online persons. So to answer that question, um, we have a, a different situation with respect to the the pre. I don't want to say precursor, but remember now um, before we were dealing with uh, a dome in the crater. Now we don't have a dome. We have a, a vent um, that is is. Is, a, is where the source of the magma and the explosions um, would have taken place from. So we are looking for changes um, in seismicity and ground, particularly seismicity, as well as the gas and, um, and the ground affirmation signals to, to tell us what could be happening in terms of going forward. With respect to an, another um, explosion, you know, um, it, the volcano becoming explosive, Again, um, we expect to see, you know, different precursory signals, but the first of which would most likely be um, the restart of VT activity. This would indicate a fresh batch of magma moving up. And then because we now have that op more open system, we will see the an increase in the SO2 degassing. So there would be, uh, and of course, the ground affirmation changes. So we will see signals um, of, of that happening. But um, 
but I know, <laughs> Richie, that this is a book, you know, that you've studied intensely. And um, in terms of the way in which it behaves, you could probably also add in terms of the type of behavior that, that uh, you know, provide some information based on the type of behavior that uh, Lassofre has seen in the past has certainly been something more discreet in terms of uh, explosion happening and then things slowly retain it to background level. I'm not saying that this is what will happen, but, but this is a the typical pattern here. But if, of course, if, if that is to change, we, we are monitoring over time to see if um, if an eruption could restart, explosive eruption could restart. I hope that I answered that question. And maybe perhaps. Certainly, um, and, I, and I don't want to take up any time and, and sort of respond to any of those. So, um, so I'll leave it there and go on to a question. There are a couple of questions that Ms. Forbes could handle, but I think there's, there's one particular I think that might be quite interesting to hear your perspective. Um, and this relates to your reflections in terms of looking back at the event. Um, what do you think are two areas, two aspects of the eruption or the, or the not much, so much eruption, but the whole event and management of it that you think worked? Or successfully worked? What, what are, maybe the person asked about two aspects, but I think what are aspects of it that you think work? And, and secondly, what are some of the aspects that you think that are in urgent need of, of improvement going forward? Um, you know, what worked? Um, somebody, two things at least that worked and, and two things that you think that needs urgent improvement. Over to Ms. Forbes. Okay, thanks, Richie. Um, what worked? I there were two extremes in terms of the evacuation process. And I think we really have to examine the, 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 the community makeup. What worked on the leeward side in particular, we saw the community disaster organizations really um, pull together and execute their evacuation planning. And this was so through the work that we would have done over the years. Um, we heard talk about community-based organizations. These things have been ongoing in St. Vincent for quite a bit of time. Some groups are stronger than others. And the the way the North Leeward in particular, District Disaster Group worked with Nemo and the other organizations and really executed the evacuation planning via the sea, that really worked. And that really came through years of working with that community and, and also having strong leaders within that community who really understood their role and have been involved for quite some time in what work. What work is a, is a science. Um, we need to be guided by science and in, in these instances. And I think the, the whole idea of developing the network and look and creating that citizen science partnership over the years really allowed us to effectively um, communicate the information um, to the public in terms of when it was time for you to get out of, of the community in terms of, of that. Now improvements, um, what, what we are seeing, we had a structure um, and it, it has worked for some time, but we saw that a, a big event like this, and a, a large event like this, where it's, it's the biggest event we have had in St. Vincent and the Grandins in terms of in recent times, in, at least in our current um, lifetime managing event that we need to relook our, um, our structures, we need to relook our systems, we need, we need to relook the organization's roles and responsibilities within, within the system. I note one of the presenters talk about um, mainstream and disaster management across all sectors. It's something that we have been pushing for for over a decade, but yet it has not been happening. And uh, we need to really relook how we position disaster risk management throughout the entire um, entire nation, not just the civil service, because it's all of society approach. So that's one. What the, what I think we need to look at also is the resource mobilization for for for, for um, disaster risk management. I think one of my disappointment leading up to this particular explosive eruption is that many persons thought that the last affair would stay effusive for a long time. Nobody thought it would, you know, and it would go explosive. I mean, so it was difficult for, for us to have persons understanding that vision, understanding that preparedness. Why were, why were we taking it seriously? Because they thought, okay, it would be like a 1971-72 event and not go explosive for another five, seven, seven years or so. But you know, and it was difficult to, to, to mobilize resources because many persons did not recognize it as an emergency, which was sad. It was already erupting um, effusively, but many, many persons did not see it as an, a, an actual um, emergency. And that was one of the downside. We need to look at each event as a, 
as a separate event, even though it's an it's um and each event will not necessarily be the same. 1971, 72, 1979 versus 2020, 21 versus 1902. Every event is different. Thank you very much. Um, and if my final question passed, unless if I actually have another one in case we have time, but this one goes to Ms. Riley. It could perhaps be one that could be addressed by, by Ms. Forbes too, but I think I would like you, Liz, to address it in the context of sort of the regional agency. And this speaks to the fact that is there, I mean, do we need to address the legal or regulatory framework to deal with emergency communications? You know, um, the whole question of, of if you, uh, or maybe it already exists, if you need to get information out, is there a framework legally um, that a, a regulatory program that allows the disaster agencies to get emergency messages out rapidly. Um, so it, is that in the broadcast license for the for the institutes that operate broadcast stations in the region? I don't know, you would know a lot about the agency, the, the legal framework in the region in terms of emergency broadcast. I don't know if you could address that. No, thanks, Richie, and thanks so much for the question. It's, it's a very interesting question. So the model comprehensive disaster management legislation that has been prepared by SEDEMA does contain specific language with respect to messaging to populations and that interface with the telecommunications sector to ensure that authoritative messages um, from credible institutions get out. Now, in terms of speaking from the lens of what individual states have in place, I can't speak to that specifically. But what I can tell you is that in revising the legislation a few years ago, this was one of the areas that we had discussed with our participating states. And in fact, the participating states had flagged it as a specific component that needed to be spoken to not only within the bill, but also within the regulations. And it is treated under the umbrella of the early warning systems because the communication of the message is one of those four components of end-to-end -end, uh, people-centered um, early warning systems. So mm -hmm. I, I hope that assists a bit um, to find yep. out about the national level. I think we have to delve specifically into national level legislation to see what exactly is there, but the model bill does speak to it. Okay. Um, yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure if we are, I think we are almost out of time. I'll just leave, if, if, if I can, yeah, we can take, right, good. So let's, let's move then over to, to um, Dr. Smith. Um, it's more a, a, a comment and, and for a reflection. You've given us lots of ideas about things that that um, certainly we need to think about going forward from lessons going forward. Um, I'd like you to, to speak to what one challenge that we had um, during this eruption and you've had in past events like this, is that the response, as as, as Liz said, there is a there is a certain amount of latency in terms of of resource mobilization often the 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 response and emergency is triggered when an event happens and because you had the build up being an effusive eruption the event in the perception of some had not happened and therefore in the context of going forward do you what do you think we need to do in terms of getting the response that is required in events that may have a very slow onset um, and something big hasn't happened. Do you think, at the, the, do you think, for example, having community-based organizations and having a response at the local level, what kinds of things can you reflect on that might help in terms of getting that response, that resource mobilization more rapid um, in, in slow onset events? Let's, um, Rose, Rosemary, 
as to you. In terms of a, <laughs> that's a good question in terms of a challenge that we face. And I would say across the Caribbean, we have we, we are a very reactive people. And that is why I, I, I call for the mainstreaming of, of disaster in um, disaster risk management into school's curricula because I really believe that we have to, it, it's a cultural um, issue, you know, um, it's, it's, it's almost who we are. And if we are going to, to change culture, we really have to be bombarding people with, com um, with information. So we are saying we have in the volcanic week and we do have a volcanic week. And I'm quite certain that if you, you ask, you might see the, the same faces always coming to the volcanic um, week activities and they are the persons who would have moved first. You know, who we need to be tapping into are those persons who don't actually come out, right? Who don't support the process and who do, those persons who do not have access and um, to the information. So that is why I'm saying we really have to change, start with the very young. This is a long-term change, right? Um, if an eruption should happen in, God forbid, in, in, in the next two weeks, you might find everybody move because it's fresh in the mind, but give them a year, give them a two, we forget. What we want to do is find a way of keeping this thing fresh, keeping this information fresh. And I am seeing um, we have a national TV station and, 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 and we, we need to, to have a, a six o'clock or five o'clock or whatever where we always have some sort of disaster management program. Disaster risk management has to become a part of us so that the information is always there, you know? So every morning we say we have this person with their talk program and so on, but do we have a, 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 a one hour slot, you know, every day where we can say this is, you know, um, disaster rich, where we can invite community groups to say this is your week to control the program, to present, right? Because this is a collaborative effort. It's a cultural change effort. And so it's not a one-off thing to say, you know, do this and it will fix. It's actually about changing culture. And to change culture, it means that we have to be educating people daily from primary and hopefully as they go into secondary, this information will become so much a part of them that when they hear move, they will move. Um, and I hope I, I was able to address it, you know, in, in some way or, or the other. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thanks very much to all the panelists. Um, I think we'll wrap up here. Um, I know that there are some people who have asked questions in the chat, and I can assure you we would look back at them and try to get them answered. Certainly, if you have any volcanological questions, anything to do with the, the volcanology, I, I, would, I would commit to personally going in and responding and making sure that you get a response. Um, I, I'd like to thank all the panelists. I think we certainly have a lot to think about. We have gotten a good overview of what has happened in terms of this eruption. We have gotten a very good insight into what the crisis response was. And we certainly see that in terms of, of volcanic eruptions and the multi-hazard environment in which we exist in the region, we need to look at it in a regional perspective. And that certainly there are lots of lessons going forward. There's lots of lessons that this tell this can give to St. Vincent and Grenadines, but wider regionally, it can tell us a lot about what we need to do in terms of putting our acts in order so that we can be better placed to respond to and, and to live with hazards that we have to live with, like, like volcanoes. So I'd just like to turn you over now to Ms. Edwards, Dr. Edwards, who will give the vote of thanks. And again, encourage you, if you have any questions, keep the questions going, we'd, we'd, we'd respond to them in the chat as time goes on. And we look forward and, uh, to, to, to further discussions. And we thank the, the faculty and the Department of Geography and Geology for helping us reach out to us and helping us uh, from a seismic perspective to get involved in this, this activity. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And what an afternoon it has been. And so it is for me to thank all of you who have made the journey with us where we moved from science through to governance and institutional arrangements. And I certainly learned a lot about the complexity of disaster response at the national level, the regional level, the challenges that we face with response, um, just the whole coordination. And of course, we moved on to our final presenter who looked so much at the social and cultural mores and the reality of resilience and how do we um, address resilience through research. So it has been a very full afternoon. And 
Of course, such an event would not be possible without many persons and organizations who it is upon me to thank for their role. We were ably moderated by Professor Richard Robertson, and we thank him for moving us through the proceedings. And of course, the food for thought that we had provided by Dr. Joseph, Dr. Smith, Ms. Forbes, and Ms. Riley. This event was hosted by the Department of Geography and Geology, whose head, Dr. Donovan Campbell, was an early conceptualizer about this discussion, along with the UE Seismic Research Center. From UE Seismic, I would like to acknowledge Ms. Alia Juman and Stacy Edwards and all the other staff members who supported them in making this event possible. We'd like to acknowledge the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, the National Emergency Management Organization of St. Vincent, and the Dean's Office for the Faculty of Science and Technology at the Mona Campus. Um, our Dean, Professor Michael Taylor, um, was very supportive of the event. And within the faculty office, I'd also like to acknowledge Mrs. Terry Ann Collins Frey, our secret weapon and Swiss Army knife, who did so much to make this event come together. Uh, we'd also like to acknowledge Miss Claudia Lewis, who provided the wonderful graphics for the poster and the screen holder that you would have seen at the start of the broadcast. And most of all, because we are using their platform and because of the meticulous attention that they pay to detail for sound, video, and all aspects of quality, I would like to thank the UETV team led by Jeanette Carew and our technical leads, Maxi Baldeo and Mistral Baldeo. Uh, also supported by Jemani Don. So the UETV team were first fabulous with the attention to detail and the support that they provided to us as we worked through the technical challenges of putting persons together from across the region for a broadcast. Um, of course, this is a part of the Sands Today um, forum, and so we acknowledge um, Dr. Andre Coy, who is the Faculty of Science and Technology Associate Dean for Outreach, um, who also lent his support to this evening's event. And of course, with all of those persons and organizations, there would have been no event without you, the audience. And so we'd like to acknowledge all the persons who joined us, whether by UETV, um, through YouTube, or any other platforms um, for this afternoon's event. And it is upon me to just say to thank you to all and to have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hi. Bye. Bye. Good rest of the evening. Bye. All right. Yeah, Take Rosanna, care, everyone. Gonna... Bye. Rosanna, Bye. I'm gonna Bye. Rosanna, I'm going to contact you. Rosanna, I'm going to contact you, right? All those things that you said, you have to you have to put them into place, right? Don't worry. I'm coming after you. <laughs> I, have no, I have no problem working for my island. Fantastic. You know, you know how much right. I love my Great. island. <laughs> good, good. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Right. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Ms. Forbes.